Hi, I am Kath Ann Hendricks from Marshall Public Library, and we are here to do our monthly While You're at the Library show. And I am standing in for Catherine Poulter, who is not here right now. So I get to introduce everybody and let them talk about books, and maybe occasionally I'll even talk about a few books. So I am going to turn to Christy and introduce Christy, who is the, we just went over this three <laughs> times, lead reference librarian. Yes. And Trent, who is a reference specialist, yes. And John, who is also a reference I'm specialist. I'm also a reference specialist. And I am the young adult librarian. And this is going to be, what did we call it? Um, reference, I forgot the, what we were going to call this. <laughs> it was the nonfiction special edition, I think. Yes, this is a reference special edition. Oh, yes, nonfiction special edition, because I indeed also have nonfiction books to talk about if they need me to talk about something. <laughs> Let's start with Christy. Oh, all right. So I have brought a few things today from our display, um, and it is on the eclipse. I'm sure everyone has heard a few things. We're having an eclipse, an eclipse in August. No. <laughs> That's what they say. And so we have um, a great display. So I've got several books. We've got great kids books, we have DVDs, we have life of people that follow eclipses everywhere, mm -hmm. um, and we also have a lot of information about safety and things that you should be prepared for. Um, so you can come in and take a look at the solar eclipse display, grab a couple of books. Um, also, I'd like to point out that the city of Pocatello has a website, so that's pocatello.us slash eclipse and that's got lots of safety information. Um, we did have, in the past tense, eclipse glasses. Um, we were able to pass out a thousand eclipse glasses this month, and we are, we are out. Um, no more eclipse glasses. Most of the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you may call before you come in and just check to see if we found a few extra pairs, um, but as far as I know right now, we are out of eclipse glasses. So what do they call a person who chases after eclipses? Is that eclipse chaser? Like it says the life chaser? of an eclipse chaser. So yes, there <laughs> okay. are people. And uh, I guess from looking at this and a few other things, one of the reasons we're looking at having so many people come is because a relatively low chance of clouds that would obscure the eclipse. Unless we have fires. So. Which so. we there hope are, there aren't. are a lot of places in t other places in town that have eclipse glasses. Yes, and you can go to the Southeastern Idaho Public Health website. I didn't write it down, I'm sorry. Um, they have lists of uh, retailers and other places in town and also in Idaho Falls that still have eclipse glasses. There's a lot that are still for sale. Do you know if there have any that are um, free or? I don't know of any that are still that are for free. free. I would check the eye doctors. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> think they're a fairly good bet. But if you go to the um, Southeastern Idaho District website, you can look for a list of um, businesses, retailers, other places, and you can contact them to see if they still have glasses. Okay. Trent, what have you got to share? Well, um, a display that's just about to be taken down because it is the end of summer. Um, this display was about the summer of love. It's been 50 years since 1967, which was the summer of love. The Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band came out. We've got several books about that famous Beatles album, um, written by people who make their lives all about the Beatles. And there's lots of fascinating tidbits of, look at all the psychedelia, the sound. <laughs> This, this yeah, this particular book um, breaks things down in terms of like what was going on in in history at the time, which were current events, and it talks about the forces that kind of brought all the elements together and the people that brought the album together. So, and here's another one that also deals with the same subject. And then of course we have Can't Buy Me Love, The Beatles, Britain, and America by Jonathan Gould. This is one of the acknowledged best books that talks about the Beatles and their influence on popular culture, um, breaks it down where these four men came from, the influences that, that shaped them, how they came together as a band, and then you know what happened to them as they went through that experience of being the Beatles. 
Um, we, th we have other books that aren't Beatles related um, on this display. It really is all about the summer of love. I, if I remember, we've got a book on the history of the Seven Day War, I think it was, when Israel got established as a state, or they, they actually they took more territory. That's what it was. So, um, yeah, the summer of love. Probably coming down at the end of August. Tell no more love. Right. <laughs> no more summer. Could no more summer. We leave it up until September 21st? Because that's when summer officially ends. You know? uh -huh. Well, that depends on how you gauge the seasons. If you gauge the seasons by the height of the season, then yes. But if you gauge the height of the season as the middle of the season, then we're almost into fall, like next week. Okay. Mm hmm. Hmm. <laughs> John? Oh, me? Okay. I think it's All you. right. Uh, well, I'm actually not doing so many books today as I am They're documentaries. They're lighter, lighter weight than Yeah, I, I got tired <laughs> of dragging things around. So, uh, But um, a couple of documentaries on Antarctica that I've picked up for the uh, collection. This one's called Ar uh, Antarctica, Ice and Sky. And the director is Luc Jacquet. Uh, he did March of the Penguins. Oh. Okay, and this documentary is about a scientist named Claude Lorius, who started in the 50s, began to go to Antarctica, and he studied snow and ice, and he's actually the man who discovered that um, bubbles in the ice could be measured for the volume of carbon dioxide mm. uh, that corresponded to the time that those bubbles formed in the ice. So he was able to do a lot of research on what the climate has been in the past and uh, really establishing the you know the reality of global warming through his research so um, it's a beautiful movie and uh, it's slow moving it's thoughtful it's a rumination on a life in science and on the meaning of the knowledge gained with such effort and sacrifice as well as the joy of discovery it's a, in the form of a narration uh, it's a translation of uh, an account by Claude Laureus. He's French, so uh, it's really a good film. So that was one of the Antarctica movies. The other one is this one, and uh, this one I, is so good, I'm going to watch it again. This one is uh, Antarctica, A Year on the Ice. There's a photographer named Anthony Powell who actually designed a lot of equipment for you know to take to Antarctica to do his filming. and. Um, he was uh, stationed at McMurdo Station, which is a U.S. facility there. It's, it's near a New Zealand station called Scott Station. Those, those two stations are really close by one another. Uh, but he was, even though he's from New Zealand, he worked at McMurdo. And um, they have a population of about 1,000 people in the Antarctic summer, which is the reverse of our summer. So Christmas happens kind of at the height of their summer. And uh, they have a population of about 1,000 people there, including research scientists, cooks, carpenters, mechanics, computer technicians, all the support people they need mm -hmm. to operate the station. Um, then when they get into their fall, they, there's this frantic effort to bring supplies in. Because they um, won't be able to. Tons of supplies. <laughs> and yeah. most, of, uh, eight, most of the people leave. They leave about 200 people at the facility over the winter. And once, once they're shut down for the winter, there's no way to get in or out. Mm -hmm. uh, and they start having hurricane force winds and uh, regular on a regular basis. Wow. And they're all trapped inside. And they go from having 24-hour daylight to 24-hour darkness. Mm -hmm. And uh, they get kind of crazy. <laughs> they, you know, there's, there's this uh, condition that they call T3. That there is describes the sort of the condition that the researchers who were there over the winter get into, where they start say there's one guy used the word he used the uh, he uh a lot in his sentences. Oh no! It's like say uh this uh that, but in when he got T three he'd start saying uh <laughs> it's just like. And Slow, right? Other yeah. people would, would, yeah, they'd forget what they were saying in the middle of a sentence, oh. and uh, so yeah. that was interesting to see that. So is that 
just because of the isolation or the lack of light or do they have do they attribute I think it's it to anything? all of those things i think huh. it's the it's the isolation the lack of light cabin fever kind mm. of being stuck inside they you know they, they have to entertain themselves they end up doing some really crazy things to entertain themselves I would imagine <laughs> but um the photographer powell um he used a lot of time lapse cameras he set up a lot of time lapse cameras so there's there's footage of McMurdo Station from a distance that shows it, time lapse scenes of the station. Getting buried, no. <laughs> yeah, being, yeah, being snowed on, and uh, time lapses of the night sky, which is amazing because uh, the southern hemisphere faces the, the Milky Way. <laughs> and so they see many more stars down there than we do. And then there's the uh, Aurora Australis, which is the you know, equivalent to the Aurora Borealis, mm -hmm. only it's in the Southern Hemisphere. And he's got footage of that. And ah. it's just a, an amazingly beautiful documentary. It's really, it's worth watching a couple times. And then, uh, so if you want to, you know, if you go for the extras that come with it, you should definitely get some of the comic relief, which is when a, there's a penguin that attacks a camera. <laughs> and that's kind of fun to see. So. All in all, this is, this is really worth seeing, I'm and I'll be watching it again. Cool. Well, I will share one book right now. I pulled some books that are um, purchased with the young adult, for the young adult collection in nonfiction, and this book is called Bad Girls of Fashion, and it's about the style rebels from Cleopatra to Lady Gaga. And I just thought it was pretty interesting because um, it covers just a brief, you know, couple of pages on each of these different people. You have Cleopatra, Marie Antoinette, Coco Chanel, uh, Frida, I don't know if it's Kalo or Kahlo, I don't know that name, Marlene Dietrich, Diana Friedland, Madonna, um, uh, Ray Kawakubo, Kathleen Hanna, and Lady Gaga. And I remember Madonna when she first came out I was just thinking about that and she was considered you know sinner or saint a lot of people were really upset when she first became popular because she took the name Madonna and did you know they thought that was um, Sacrilege. sacrilegious and she was quite out there you know to, at that time and then of course Lady Gaga came along but I thought what one of the things I thought was interesting about her is that um, she became famous um, for her, um, sh oh, there was a group of people that started following her. They called her the Mother Monster because of a, a, a song or something that came out called Fame Monster, and it's, it featured the single bad romance. At any rate, um, she was a patron saint for people who considered themselves as outsiders or freaks. And beyond that, I mean, she's done a lot of crazy things, uh, seemingly. She's done things to stand up for political causes. Um, and I think she says, if, I don't, if we don't stand up for what we believe in and we don't fight for our rights, pretty soon we're going to have as much rights as the meat on our own bones. And that was in relation to when she dressed with mm -hmm. steaks and meat, meat all over her. <laughs> but I'm really impressed with her and what she does for people in general. She's shown up, you know, unexpectedly at schools and, you know, rallied behind causes and raised money for things and given a lot of things away. So, I mean, there's more to her than just her being, you know, um, a mad girl of a fashion. Mad, yeah, a mad girl <laughs> of fashion. But anyway, that was just one person that struck me in there besides, um, of course, the people. Here's Pierce Coco Chanel's fashion. The Kawakubo is. Did she do the? I don't know what she did. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think she might have done the some of the costuming for. Oh, let's see Dracula. That's, oh yeah, I haven't looked up. She was anti-fashion. Let's see what she says about her 142. Just all sorts of interesting people, and you know, just a little bit of it. Of course, Marilyn Monroe and the famous um, subway skirt. vent. Um, here we go. I don't know if I can find the information you were looking at. He'll have to check out the book. Rihanna's in here. 
Um, it says her bad girl cred was ragged, tattered, lumpy, boxy. She made ugly interesting and changed the meaning of fashion for women, women who refused to fit the mold. So there you Doesn't go. Doesn't sound like that when I was Re thinking. Ray Kawakudo. So anyway, has some interesting things in it. Um, it says uh, clothes can be a statement of a statement, a work of art, or even a weapon. So weaponized clothing. Ooh. Weaponized clothing. <laughs> <laughs> so that is in our nonfiction collection. Right now, it's on the. I'm pulled books off of our new nonfiction shelf. So on our way over here, we actually listened for a moment, but so I have to admit I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> uh, but this is David Sedaris's, um, it's called Theft by Finding, and it's his diaries from 1977 to 2002. So this is the first part. There will be a second part that is diaries from 2003 forward. Um, a lot of people know his voice. That's why I got the audio book, even though I don't listen to audio books a lot. Um, but I really, um, I really like listening to David Sedaris. Most people know him from This American Life, um, oh, or wow. also from kind of what shot him forward was his uh, Santaland diaries about his... Uh, he was an elf. Yes, his <laughs> time as an elf at Macy's. <laughs> I think he was um, mentioned last, the last TV show, I think somebody brought up something, maybe that same one. And well, it's book form. I think that, yeah, we've got the book and we've got the audio mm -hmm. book. Um, people are very back and forth over David Sedaris. A lot of people really like him. And the, the Santa Land Diaries, they play it every year at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. It's like one of the most requested things ever. Um, in the intro, he says that he, he says, I don't really expect anyone to read this from start to finish. It seems more like the sort of thing you might dip in and out of, like someone else's yearbook or a collection of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is, you know, every day he kept a diary from the point mm -hmm. that he was a young child. He still does. He writes every day. Um, I got to the point where he was um, actually, you, you hit the Santaland Diaries a couple times. One, when he first actually gets a job at Macy's. And then again, when he talks about filming it from, or recording it for This American Life. And then getting all of these phone calls and kind of that push into fame. Um, he talks a lot about his family. A lot of people know his sister, Amy Sedaris. Um, I didn't realize how many things he has actually done. Um, he did artwork. He went to the Chicago Institute of Art. Hmm. Um, and even while he became quite famous and had books out and had, you know, radio programs and other things, he was still doing just a litany of of short jobs, uh, moving people in New York, um, cleaning houses, um, which just intrigues me that somebody that, you know, shot up and has several books out and book deals is still basically cleaning people's houses. <laughs> 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 I don't know if you did it for the stories because they're really great stories. <laughs> uh, uh, <ooh> <laughs> I will put a caveat in there that uh, this is not, you know, public access friendly. A lot of it there is there's some swearing, there's... So if you're quite driving down the road on your trip and you've got young kids in the car, maybe yes. that wouldn't be the one you want Yeah, you play. might have to hit the <laughs> skip button really quickly. Um, the other thing I think that was really interesting about it is a lot of times when you look at memoirs or diaries, they're very... Um, some people think they're boring because they're, they're more inward facing, they're the person's thoughts. Mm -hmm. But this really isn't. <laughs> it's still stories. It's still, um, you can, if you've read other books or listened to them at all, it's kind of like getting an extra edition. Here's the extra deleted scenes from the Santa Land Diaries or mm -hmm. um, from different books. Um, they're really more um, still his observations, the things that happen around him. You do get a little bit of his thoughts, and you do get a lot of information about his family, which is back and forth his relationship there but still it's mostly um, you can you can really listen to it you can really dip in and out of it you can get these little vignettes these little stories so I like it I I'm almost done I'll bring it back soon <laughs> <laughs> well my next book is uh, is also a book in progress I'm in the middle of reading this but uh, The Dorito Effect by Mark Schatzker. Um, I started reading this as uh, 
as I was being driven up to Idaho Falls for some family function. There's been a lot of family reunions this year. But I was immediately struck in the, in the beginning of this book where he talks about the beginning of Weight Watchers. And the lady who began Weight Watchers, she ended up starting Weight Watchers because she was mistaken for being pregnant in a supermarket by someone who knew her. And mm. so she went to this um, dietitian who was, you know, kind of having a, a, gr a group and just miserable, having miserable, miserable time. But she started meeting with friends of hers who were also overweight. And this meeting of like, you know, four or five people grew to what Weight Watchers is now. And then he, he segues into how the Dorito was created. Um, and he uses these things as, as a springboard to establish his basic premise, which is that we as a society, we as a people, have divorced flavor from, the, from, the, from, from food, F flavor from the things that they used to represent. So like, for instance, the Dorito started out as a corn chip, a tortilla chip that was salty. And when they introduced Doritos, which by the way means little pieces of gold, it, anyway, um, <laughs> when, when, when they started marketing Doritos, they were literally just tortilla chips, but they weren't selling all that well. And so they got the idea to make them taste like tacos. So they added the taco flavoring, and that's when Doritos really took off nationwide. And you know, as you know now, there's like all kinds of flavors of Doritos, chicken waffle, exactly. Chips and <laughs> but he talks about how flavor is one of our most keen senses, and it involves more circuitry of the brain than most of our other senses. And the reason for this is because of the survival that um, that leads to. We were we're hardwired to find foods that have this flavor or that flavor because of the nutrients and the micronutrients that are in them. Mm. And when we divorce flavor from food, we start going after foods that aren't actually as nutritious, as healthy for us. And we've also perfected flavor technology to the point where it triggers our, our brain and we just cannot stop eating. It, at one point in the book, he talks about how he visits this sheep farm. And um, he's shown this chemical, this flavor chemical, that they add to the feed of the sheep to fatten them up quickly. They've been shown to eat like 15 to 20% more per feeding when this chemical is added to their feed. And he actually took a little bit of a taste of it. He said it was, it was an explosion of sweetness. It was, it was way too much. But it's, it's, a, it's a chemical to add sweetness to the, to the feed. Huh. And so the sheep eat it. And so this book has, has really pull, pulled me in and made me a lot more conscious about what I put in my mouth and whether or not this, this sugar water that tastes like a grape is actually going to deliver to me the nutrients that an actual grape with good grape flavor would bring. He talks also about how like tomatoes or corn have been bred to the point of blandness oh, yeah. that we don't want those foods anymore. And you know they're nutritious, but they don't taste like what they're supposed to taste like. So, mm -hmm. anyway, the Dorito effect by Mark Schatzker, fascinating read, makes you very conscious about what you're eating. <laughs> did, mm. he, did he talk about sucralose in there? Or? I yes, he talks about sucralose. He talks about artificial sweeteners. Mm. Yeah, it's mm. it's an amazing book. Mm. Oh, it's me. <laughs> it's your turn. Okay. Um, so um, I just ran across this book randomly on the bookshelf. It's one we've had for a few years. It's called Thinking Small. I used to have one of those cars. The Long Strange mm -hmm. Trip of the Volkswagen Beetle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's by Andrea Hyatt. And uh, it's a little outdated in the sense that none of uh, Volkswagen's scandals involving their diesel cars are are in this book. <laughs> and so that wasn't a diesel. <laughs> yeah, so, so when you <laughs> whoops. Yeah, so when you're reading this, it's like it's a fairly in a lot of ways it's a fairly laudatory book of the company and 
you know, knowing about the whole diesel scandal might kind of color uh, <laughs> your your reaction to some of the things that she says about them. But it it is a very interesting book. Mm -hmm. um, so if you know anything about the origin of the Volkswagen Beetle, uh, it was came to being in Hitler's Germany. It was a a car maker, an engineer named Ferdinand Porsche, who came up with the design. And he just had a dream of a small car that would be available to everybody. Because at that time in Germany, only the very rich could afford cars. And uh, there, was, there, were no, there was no equivalent to the Model T in Germany. Um, so that was his dream, was to see that come into being. And it turns out that Adolf Hitler was an automobile nut. And so he and, uh, he and Porsche uh, got together at some point. He, I guess he, uh, f Hitler found out about Porsche and asked to meet him. And they became kind of buddies around the whole issue of automobiles. And in all other respects, uh, Porsche was pretty well divorced from what Hitler was doing. He was, mm. it was he kind of had a bit of naivete around that. And uh, even Albert, you know, Albert Speer, after the war ended, uh, asserted that he shouldn't be prosecuted. You know, he, he said that he himself should be prosecuted, but he asserted that Ferdinand was like ignorant and, and that they, were, they just talked about cars. And uh, he developed this relationship with Hitler such that he could say things to Hitler that nobody else could. And it was be, it, people thought that Hitler sort of regarded him in some ways as kind of a father figure. Mm -hmm. um, but the other interesting thing about that, you know, there's a famous photo of Hitler looking at a model of a VW, which mm -hmm. is, you know, you, I'm sure you can find it on the internet. Um, uh, the VW be Beetle was never actually made in quantity before the war. They had like 30 prototypes that they actually made before the war started. And then the war came along, and to Ferdinand Porsche's disappointment, kind of upended all their plans for manufacturing the car. Um, and they ended up building military vehicles on the chassis that was designed for the Volkswagen. Mm. I think there was a the Thing. There was a vehicle called the Thing that was actually mm -hmm. like a re-release of a staff car that the Germans made for military uses, and then they found the plans for it and, and re-released it in the uh, late 60s as a kind of a fun vehicle. So, mm -hmm. um, so Porsche, uh, at the end of the war, Porsche was kind of out of the, the loop on everything because he ended up being kidnapped and imprisoned by the French. Oh. And uh, they, uh, an, uh, a rival of his who worked for Opel ended up taking over the company and managing the company there was a, a British soldier who was, he was kind of charged with getting industry going again uh, mm -hmm. through uh, this auto plant that they had in the town of Wolfsburg, which is where the, where Volkswagen is base, based. And the town was, it was actually called the, uh, the town of the strength through joy car, because that was what they call, originally called the, ta the car, the strength through joy car. Strength. And then the place it was built was the town of the Strength Through Joy car. That's well, that a lot of work. That, <laughs> didn't that didn't survive the war, so they ended up they ended up renaming the place Wolfsburg. So, um, the book also covers a kind of interesting bit of history, though, in that one of the things that made the Beatles so successful was their choice of advertising agency uh, to promote the car in the United States. And the advertising agency was uh, DDB, Doyle, Dane, and Bernbach. Uh, and they basically, they broke all of what were considered to be the rules of ad making up to that time, uh, in part through their VW ads. And um, they were just incredibly famous for their ads. They, they kind of became the model for the madman type of, of uh, advertising business. So, so this book covers a lot of the history of that too, and uh, it's kind of they talk about how the VW basically they rode the crest of a cultural wave uh, to its success 
and it wasn't it wasn't just the advertising it was a lot of changes that happened in the 60s uh, people moving away from huge cars with big fins and things like that so this is a really interesting history of that and, and I would strongly recommend it so well, I will share this one real quick this one is called Samurai Rising it's the epic life of I, I went through this once before Minamoto Yoshitsune. I got it right this time. <laughs> um, this was on the um, Young Adult. It won an award for Young Adult Excellence in Nonfiction for this um, last year in 2017. This is about the man who became the most famous samurai of all. He was a child exile, a teenage runaway, a military genius, and then an immortal hero. And initially he was exiled to a monastery. He had no money, no allies, no martial training. He wasn't good, big, strong, or good looking. His only assets were his brains, his ambition, and a dream. But at age 15, he escaped, and then he learned the art of the sword. And it's a very, very um, easy to read um, history and story of this person's life and it's written on the young adult level and when they win that type of an award that means that they are a very well written books so this um, I would recommend the Samurai Samurai Rising the epic life of Minamo Mi Minamoto Yoshitsune something like that <laughs> can't say that name very well so um, we've got this book in it is uh, the National Geographic the photo arc and it is a one man's quest to document the world's animals. Um, so the uh, photographer is jo Joel Satori. Um, this is also, uh, they have a, let's see, there is a PBS show as well. So this is a multi-year effort to raise awareness of the solutions to some of the most pressing issues affecting wildlife and their habitats. So their aim is to document um, all animals that are threatened, endangered, um, animals that are in zoos, animals that are in wildlife sanctuaries. It also includes insects, um, and that's why it's the photo arc, so it's photographs of it. Um, I thought what was kind of neat about this as well is that it's not just animals, but he also highlights who he calls um, heroes. So he uh, has eight in this book, and then there's more on the PBS programming as well that are people um, that are working on um, unique and different programs so they maybe not just breeding or maybe not just uh, or maybe they don't even work with animals specifically but they work with um, the environment and trying to preserve habitat and it's just I mean the photography is stunning so there's just some he did some mirrors oh, oh wow. so you can mm. see the the mirrored look of the faces and the animals and the insects um, and it's beautiful. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, even when they're not beautiful, there's naked role mole rats and other things <laughs> in here as well. They're, they're beautiful to another That's naked mole rat. That's out of control. <laughs> Ooh, so that, what kind of a frog is it? Those are toads. It's a toad or a frog? Rubber frogs. Oh. Rubber frogs. Tempasar, rubber frogs, and then little fluffy penguins. Are there koalas babies. in there? Yes. <laughs> There's all kinds of animals in here. It's beautiful. Um, and it's, I mean, it's even more stunning when you look at, um, like I said, some of the heroes. So this is the um, Ludwig Siffert, and he is the uh, Ugandan carnivore program. So he works specifically with carnivores, which are hard to help because when you have the carnivores and then you have the animals that they eat that are also endangered. Um, but he's doing a lot of work in Uganda. He's one of the eight heroes that are highlighted in this book. And it's just stunning photography and it also really makes you think about um, things like climate change and dwindling areas and um, mm. and animals that are, you know, endangered or threatened and also animals that are um, and sanctuaries, so there's a lot of mm. wildlife sanctuaries around that he was able to sit and photograph with. Wow. He has lots of pages also of insects, which a lot of people don't think about, but insects, butterflies, moths, 
um, that are also, yes, bees. Um, and the, the National Geographic and also PBS have, again, I hate to point to websites, but they have a lot of information. You can actually stream episodes of the PBS show. Um, full episodes that have aired are already up. There's three of them that you can see. So you can see the photographer, you can see the heroes, see the animals. Um, and then they really get into a lot of things to do. And like John said, with bees, that's one of their big um, pushes with this, too, to help the pollinators. So check this one out. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow. And makes you think. Mm. Well, I'm not sure if this book has made an appearance on this show before. But even if it has, I would like to give a ringing endorsement for this book. It's called Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. And um, this one I have finished reading. Started reading it on Memorial Day on the way home from family celebrations with, um, on Memorial Day. And I was reading aloud to the person driving the car. And we were both sucked in. We didn't mind the traffic jams on I-15. <laughs> um, Mr. Vance, he is from Ohio. But his family is from Kentucky. Um, so he, you know, he writes about the hillbilly culture that transplanted itself from Kentucky to Ohio and other places in what we call the Rust Belt now. And um, he, he says, in, in the introduction, he says it's kind of ridiculous for a 31-year-old to be writing a memoir. But he felt like he had a unique perspective on America to share. Because although Mr. Vance um, started life the child of, um, basically the child of hillbillies, he, is, uh, he served in the military successfully, was honorably discharged after his service, and he went on to be uh, a, a, a lawyer. He graduated from Yale Law, the, the, the Yale Law School and is now working as a, as a lawyer in Silicon Valley. And so he has had a unique opportunity to look into the culture of um, you know, the people that live in the Rust Belt, the people that live in you know, the mountains of Kentucky and Tennessee and Arkansas. And he also has had the opportunity to be in the culture of those who go to Yale and Harvard and who are the lawyers. And he's basically saying, here, folks, this is who each of you are to each other. This is who each of you are. You need to know each other if we are to continue to be a nation, a cohesive nation. Um, the, the accounts that he writes about of you know, his grandmother, his grandfather, his mother, his sister, um, it was actually kind of shocking to recognize myself in some of that. Um, just because, you know, here in, in rural Idaho, there are some elements of our culture that are similar to the culture that you would find amongst the hillbillies in Kentucky or, or Tennessee. And it just, it was, it was an illuminating document. There were some, some um, people that he describes that, you know, I've known people like these people that he talks about, but I've never been able to understand why they did what they did. And he makes it so clear um, so you really get to, to know a whole different set of people that you wouldn't have before. This, this is an essential book. I, I read a lot of reviews about this that say that every American should be reading this book. Um, I've seen him featured on talk shows. And to, to listen to him talk, the passion that he talks with about you know, his subject in this book. Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. We've got two copies at the library. They should always be checked out and on hold for at least five people. Read this book, <laughs> Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Do you know if we have a copy of it in um, digital format yet? We have two audiobook versions, two print book versions. I did not check to see if we have ebook versions yet. But if we don't, we should. I think there's at least one. In our collection? I think so. Good. I seem to recall looking it up at some oh. point. Good. So. Good, maybe I'll do that. OK. Um, Oh. Well, there's a movie coming out pretty soon that's called uh, Dunkirk, and it has a lot of uh, famous uh, British stars in it. Um, and it's uh, this is one of the books that was uh, that the film was based on. It's called The Miracle of Dunkirk by Walter Lord 
And it's out already, isn't it, the movie? Yeah, the movie is out already, and there's another book that the library is getting that was written by the man who actually wrote the script for the film. Um, but they, this was a, one of the books that they consulted. And uh, now I will confess to not having read this, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but the author, Walter Lord, wrote a famous book called A Night to Remember, yeah. which was an account of the sinking of the Titanic. Mm -hmm. And that was made into, he wrote that book in 1955, and it was made into a film in 1958. And I've seen the film and read the book, and the man knows how to tell a story. So this is, you know, just on the basis of that, this is recommended, and uh, the library has it now, and we'll be getting that other book too. I, you know, I can't say anything about that, but if the movie, if the book is as good as the movie is supposed to be, I expect I'll be reading that one as well. So. Um, you guys have, I guess I can talk about one more. Okay. Um, picked this one up. It is called The Fight to Learn, The Struggle to Go to School by Laura Scandifio. And the thing that was fascinating to me about this is that it's, you think it's talking about children in other countries mostly, but it's not. It talks about, does it have a chapter? Um, what causes the, you know, the why, why people have f trouble finding places to learn and, and, and learning, fighting to learn, um, because of poverty and discrimination and violence. You know, you've heard of Malala and you've heard of, you know, the discrimination that goes on with girls in um, Muslim worlds. And um, poverty is another thing that, that strikes them. But it, you know, things, a lot of this occurs well within the United States. It's not just children that are child soldiers or, um, you know, taken away for prostitution in, you know, third world countries. It's, it happens, things happen here in the United States, and violence is one of them, and he talks about the gangs in, in Illinois, in Chicago, and how that's, you know, affecting their chances to learn. And I think that education is a huge, um, deterrent to discriminate to to, to the views that people have the more educated you are I think the less discriminate discriminatory you are because you know more about you know things in the world and and it's not mm -hmm. just your narrow little th picture of the world you start seeing other things around you and um, so I think it's important that we encourage and we promote education everywhere we can and that will probably be our best um, battle against some of the the bad the worst things in in this world right now is that well the empathy too i think that's what you're mm -hmm. talking about a little bit the the ability to empathize with others and to not be scared of something that you don't know because right. you've learned which is what discrimination or prejudice is it's you're prejudging somebody because you don't know something about them because you have this little preconceived notion and you don't know your your it's fear of the unknown a lot of it so this has um, got a lot of information um, about different things that um, are hard for people to overcome in this world, but it's a good one to read if you want to learn more about it. Hmm. Um, so this book is called Tinker, Dabble, Doodle, Try. Hmm. And uh, the author is, I'm going to, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I really don't. <laughs> Serini wow, Serini 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 that's what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll come to a, a consensus. Um, he is actually a uh, Harvard psychiatrist, um, and he also does a lot of work in um, neurology, neurochemistry. Um, and this book, I, I'll admit, I just loved the title. Um, <laughs> I really did like the title. Um, but as I got into it, it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, the first thing that he talks about is uh, in inintentional, in inattentional blindness and that is where you simply miss things because um, you can't pay attention to everything no one can pay attention to everything and so we are blind to certain things just because we're thinking about too many things <laughs> it's like the gorilla in the basketball game yes 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Or um, there was one thing that he talked about where it was a, a police officer um, ran past someone being assaulted because he was responding to another crime. Oh, man. And in testimony, he said, I, I didn't see it. I absolutely, he could not remember seeing that another crime was being committed as he was responding to another. Um, and so the kind of the basic um, push of this is that he talks about um, hyper focus and that we talk a lot about attention and about focusing on things and that we need to pay attention. We do a lot in education about remaining focused and, and staying in focus all the time. Um, but then he said that that also is, is that that kind of hyper focus um, makes us miss the really truly important things. Um, and so some of this is, is in steps, um, kind of self-help wise, but others it really gets into the regions of the brain, what happens with brain chemistry, um, the, the areas of your brain that uh, go into focus when, you're, when you are focusing and when you are not focusing. Um, he said one of the other things is, is that when you say somebody's unfocused, that it's a negative, that, that everyone gets the impression that is negative. He's inattentive, he's unfocused, he's not paying attention. Um, and that, that, uh, that to him that, and to brain chemistry, focus and unfocus are two sides of the same coin. Um, so this book really uh, gets into knowing how you think, um, giving you some absolute steps to um, look at being unfocused. <laughs> Even to the point of where he says you need to plan for daydreaming or... Oh, yay. Uh, <laughs> I know, <I'm> right? <laughs> uh, to put time in your schedule to uh, dabble, to just kind of look at things, to doodle, to unfocus your mind and let your, um, not really your subconscious, but to not, when you're trying to stay focused to everything and multitask on everything, then you forget things. And that when you sit down and you, you meditate or you daydream or you look at something that you have never looked at before, whether it's artwork or um, a subject that you're not knowledgeable at all, that doing that in a somewhat unfocused way allows your brain to bring those other things back up into your life. Um, and he does have concrete steps of things to try. Um, he, it doesn't mean that you get to spend eight hours a day daydreaming. <laughs> <laughs> he says that there is a balance um, and that really it's, it's learning how you think and how your mind works and creating what he calls a, a cognitive rhythm. Um, where you're going back and forth between being focused and being slightly unfocused and getting rid of this idea that that it's inattentive or unfocused is, is bad or negative and it's not helpful. He refers to several people, um, scientists, other people that have made big breakthroughs and their um, rhythms of their day um, that may involve shorter sleep cycles or it may involve um, flexible scheduling to taking time off in the middle of the day and then coming back to it later in the day which is not there's a lot to be said for that because I know that when I've really been zoned in on something and really trying hard to get there sometimes if I could just step back and not touch it and just go away and just let it be you know that my mind kind of settles into place and goes and I come back to it later it's like oh okay now I get it now I'm okay with this I can do this because I've had time to relax and and refocus. Re I, I'm not refocused, but you know, just yeah. to take a break from it. Your mind will sort a few things out inside when when you're not thinking. I really like it. too that he has like some kind of steps of saying, you know, mm -hmm. that um, forgive yourself. Like part <laughs> of it is like because <laughs> that's the bottom of it. Part of it is trying. Trying. So is he okay. said that trying new things or trying something and failing is still okay. You need to forgive uh -huh. yourself after you've and learn lessons from it and move on. And he said that, I, and I agree with that. I think a lot of times people are very unwilling hard to do themselves. something new. They're very hard on themselves when so something doesn't work out. But they don't take away the those lessons of you know, the well, things that they is, did learn. This is what the makerspace movement is working with right now and what we've been working with in the library is this whole thing about tinkering mm -hmm. and, do and doodle and try. We call it fail forward. So if you fail at something, it's not really a failure, it's a learning process, a learning experience. You, you go back and go, okay, now what could I do differently? What worked, what didn't? 
and that's the that's what we're really trying to encourage kids to work with and and not be so hard on themselves but mm -hmm. you know say okay well we approached it this way what would happen if we did this and why didn't this work or what worked about this what would work better if we did this way just all of that mm -hmm. try I love that idea of try and he says that it's not this is not like a guidebook this isn't a one fit mm -hmm. solution to everybody he said it's really knowing how you're you know learning how how you learn how you do things mm -hmm. and putting other things into it to try to um, make it better to make yourself able to um, learn more or even come up with things and I, I found it really intriguing there is a lot more neuroscience and brain chemistry that he goes <laughs> into in the book <laughs> but he also does break it down into simple things mm. to to try out and to um, I really did like the idea of getting into your own your own rhythm so I want to read that book yeah, I know, really. <laughs> <laughs> like your uh, success <laughs> is the sum of your failures really yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. mm-hmm Cool. Well, I don't have any other books that I brought, but really quickly, I do want to let everybody know that we now have a digital archive of back issues of the Pocatello Tribune and the Idaho State Journal. It's not a complete archive, but we do have that as part of our website. So if you'd like to know how to access that, you can call us at the library. We will guide you towards that. We're working on expanding what we have in that archive. It's very exciting to have that up and, and going. So there you go. New thing at the library. Very exciting. Okay, good. Okay. Well, I, I guess there's time for something more. Um, there certainly is. Okay. I brought my favorite movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think everybody should see yes, this movie. Yes. So um, it's called Dean Stanley. And it was one of Peter O'Toole's last films. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very funny. It's a very funny movie. It's about a minister who, uh, when he drinks Tokai, which is a, it's a, like a Hungarian, kind of a fruity Hungarian wine. <laughs> when he drinks Tokai, he sort of forgets himself and he remembers his prior lifetime as a dog <laughs> and, and talks about it. And so these, these guys in the story who discover this uh, start plying him with Tokai in order to get these stories out of him because they're just really fascinated by it. And uh, the, the parent of one of the two characters who's plying the minister is played by Peter O'Toole and uh, he's, you know, he's the father of one of the two characters and um, he's just excellent in this film. It was one of his last movies and he's, he was just really good. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's got some really, a lot of really funny bits and some, <laughs> some quotable taglines. But it also deals with issues of death and with grieving. And it tackles those issues and it, it, you know, it does it very gently. It's, uh, you know, very, it's a, overall it's a very humorous film and then it kind of whops you on the head with these these conclusions about grieving and death that are just pretty, pretty true and pretty important. So, I've seen this eleven times, and <laughs> I'm not done with it yet. So, <laughs> so I have John's copy. I will watch it. I'll watch it, John. <laughs> okay, I will so watch it. <laughs> so, so highly recommended. I love it. Uh, couple more book or one more movie and one more movie. Yeah, I can do another movie. Um. La La Land won ah. some, some awards. This is a movie by the same director that he did before La La Land, and, and this one uh, did very well, too. It was, it was critically acclaimed. Um, I don't know how many people actually saw it, but it was critically acclaimed, and um, I saw it, and it's just, it's kind of, uh, it's an experience. It's a, it's a hard movie to watch at, at certain points because it's, uh, it's about a kid who's learning to drum from a teacher who is just, whose methodology is just brutal and torturous and who just basically kind of tears him down to build him up. Hmm. And so it's not, it's not pleasant to go through that at all, but the, the drumming in it is amazing. And uh, it's a, it's, the acting is really good. So 
Um, so if you've seen La La Land and you want to see something by the same director, Whiplash. So. All right. Christy, do you have a Oh, I just have a um, So this is the uh, Monsterologist, a memoir in rhyme. Um, it's ghostwritten by Bobby Katz and illustrated by Adam McCauley. And I bring it because we have one other display on the second floor. Um, so August the 18th is Bad Poetry Day. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so there are on the display some examples of really bad poetry that you should all come and read. They're great. They're good for a giggle. Um, and then below them are books of good poetry. <laughs> so, and this is pretty good. This is actually, um, it's... I love the illustrations in it, and it has lovely fold-out pages, and mm. um, and there's all kinds of different poets that are on that shelf. So come read some little clips of bad poetry, and then check out good poetry. Well, I we think we should probably talk about how the library is not going to be open oh, on the okay. 21st. Yeah, if, if in case you've forgotten that um, the eclipse is coming, which we've already talked about because we have a display. Um, the library and most of the city offices, I think, will be closed on the 21st, which is the day of the eclipse. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons for that that um, we can all think of, but um, be safe. Use your glasses, your eclipse glasses <laughs> for viewing. Fill and your gas tank up. If you have books that you know, say that they are due on the 21st, do not worry. We will go ahead and check them in as if they were turned in, re returned on time. I think they've changed the due dates on all of those mm -hmm. so that they would not be due on that date. Yep. So do not worry about rushing to the library to get them there either the night before or the day of because you'd probably be better off just waiting. Then you don't have to try to fight the traffic or, you know, leave the house or overload the book drop <laughs> because we won't be there to unload it. <laughs> so be, be safe. Be safe and you know, don't worry about bringing your books back on the 21st. And When is summer reading over? Summer reading ends this week. So tomorrow is the last day. Um, there will be a reader's brunch for the people who complete the adult reading program, but that won't be, I don't, can't remember what date it is. It's not this week or it might be sometime next week or the week after. Nice. So check our website on that. And, um, and prize final pickup. prizes will be, we'll be drawing for some things for the teen program and um, the kids too. I don't know, not drawings for the kids, but you can pick up your final prizes this week. Awesome. So. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you enjoy reading and come find us at the library. We have lots, of more, lots more things to share. <laughs>